Hello, everyone. Bonjour, Buras. Hallo, hallo, buenos dias, guten tag. My name is Marian Pitters, and I'm delighted to be the facilitator for today's webinar. I'm here to introduce our speakers, moderate some questions from you, our audience members, and ensure that the webinars progress according to the schedule so that we respect everyone's time. But first, on behalf of McMaster University, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the seventh webinar of the series, The Arctic, A Global Health Perspective. We have participants from all over Ontario, Canada, and the globe online today, graduate students, faculty from McMaster and partner institutions, as well as representatives from the World Health Organization, the WHO, and some select invitees. Many of you are preparing to contribute your skills to Arctic Global Health. We welcome you all to today's compelling session. This webinar series explores diverse perspectives on Arctic global health. Despite documented health disparities between the circumpolar north and other regions, the Arctic remains an underrepresented area in global health research. This series offers a transdisciplinary look at key global health challenges and opportunities in the circumpolar north. A quick overview of the 10 webinars in our series can be found at the Global Health website. Today's session is Webinar 7, Community Engaged Research for Northern Sustainability. It features Dr. Gita Lubachik from McMaster University. Time has been built in for questions and discussions at the end of the presentation. Please use the chat tool uh, at the bottom of your screen to submit questions electronically at any time during the presentation. And note that while we may not be able to get to all of your questions, we will aim to address them at the Global Health website after the session. This webinar series has been inaugurated by Dr. Andrea Bauman, Associate Vice President of Global Health and Director of the WHO Collaborating Center in Primary Care Nursing and Human Health Resources at McMaster University. Andrea, will you please start us off with a few words about launching this webinar series? Thank you, Marian. And I just want to welcome everyone, uh, both within McMaster and uh, outside McMaster, to our webinar series. For those of us, for those of you who may be joining for the first time, um, I'd like to welcome also on behalf of uh, the president, uh, Dr. Dave Ferrer, and uh, our vice president in health science, Dr. Paula Byrne, who have both been very supportive in um, organizing this webinar series. We look forward uh, to this particular lecture, an exciting uh, title for sure. And I'm just going to pass it over now to one of our Global Health graduate students, Jeffrey McLean, to introduce our guest speaker. Jeffrey? Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Bauman. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Gita Lubicic. Dr. Gita Lubicic is an associate professor here at the School of Earth, Environment, and Society at McMaster. I believe her research is incredibly important because of her commitment to respecting Indigenous and local knowledge and learning about the North from those who know it best. Gita leads an interdisciplinary research group called Straight Up North which focuses on community-engaged research. And recently, she was appointed to the Canada Research Chair for Community-Engaged Research for Northern Sustainability. Congratulations, Gita. On top of all that, she's an important part of my master's thesis committee. And when she isn't busy with work, she enjoys playing volleyball and has now taken to coaching her two sons' volleyball teams. So thank you for pre presenting for the next 30 minutes on community-engaged research. And Marion will give you a, a reminder when there's a couple minutes left. And then we can move into a discussion with some questions from the audience. Over to you now, Gita. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to Andrea for the invitation to be part of this webinar series. It's a really, really interesting series. and. Um, yeah, wonderful to have the opportunity to share with you as part of this series. 
Um, thanks, Jeffrey, for the introduction. It's good to see you and uh, see you in this different context. And I, I really look forward to, um, yeah, to presenting with all of you here today. Thank you for coming. Thanks for your interest. And I do really look forward to your questions at the end. So please do share some questions in the chat with Miriam, and she will facilitate that after. Um, thanks also, Adam, for for helping and trying to help me get set up on WebEx here. So um, we didn't quite manage. My computer doesn't seem to uh, to agree with it, but um, Adam's going to help change the slides for me. So hopefully everyone can see these slides okay, and Adam will help me navigate them. So thank you, everyone, and good morning. <laughs> Um, I am coming to you from Hamilton today. So as was on the earlier slide there, we're situated on the traditional territory shared between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Nation, which was acknowledged in the Dish with One Spoon wampum belt. And that wampum uses the symbolism of a dish to represent the territory and one spoon to represent the people and that all people are sharing the resources of the land and are only taking what they need. And I, I often think about the, the meaning of that wampum belt and I really identify with that and, and try to learn from that, but we all have a role to play in fulfilling that early agreement. And the vision of working together, sharing responsibility and caring for lands underlies everything that I do in the work that I do with Inuit communities in Inuit Nunangat. So that's Inuit homeland. Um, I'm originally, <clears throat> sorry, I'm originally from Ottawa in Ontario and um, always enjoyed learning outdoors, always enjoyed school, um, enjoyed learning from different cultural perspectives. I had a lot of exposure um, during my time in India to Eastern philosophies that was very influential for me. And then had a lot of um, other influences <clears throat> in my undergraduate time at York University, where I first was learning about Indigenous studies and Indigenous perspectives on the environment. And so it was something that I really wanted to continue learning about and working with. And in my master's degree, which was uh, in 2001, 2000, well, 2000 to 2002, but I had a life-changing experience camping on the tundra. So for my master's, I went to Boothia Peninsula, which is in the central Arctic in Nunavut, the northernmost part of the Canadian mainland. We were flown in on a little twin otter plane, dropped off three students, um, and we spent two months there on the tundra, camping and also learning about tundra vegetation. For someone from Ottawa who had never camped outside of a campground and, and who never really enjoyed the cold, this was a challenging experience for me. And I knew at the end I would either kind of love it or hate it. Um, and I absolutely loved it. It was, it was a great learning experience for me and it really brought home that I wanted to learn from people. I wanted to learn from Inuit who had lived on these lands for so long and to not only do remote field research. So it really changed my perspectives in a lot of ways and I wanted to continue on with school and, and working in the North. And so since then, since 2001, so um, getting on close to, well, 20 years now, since then I've been dedicated to a cooperative, community-driven approach to research that involves developing and fostering working relationships with Indigenous experts <clears throat> and organizations through all stages of the research. So I've worked with Inuit communities and academic partners to learn from Inuit knowledge about a range of topics, so covering issues like sea ice, caribou, plants, and water, and all of these in relation to implications of climate change, the importance in northern lifestyles and livelihoods, and contributions to decision-making from local to national scales. 
And my work is really aiming to explore how community-engaged research can contribute to Northern sustainability in the broadest sense of sustainability. So around cultural vitality, ecological health, and self-sufficiency. And although I don't, <clears throat> sorry, I don't know why my throat is so dry this morning, sorry. Although I don't have a specific health focus in my research, um, a lot of the, the topics that I work on, the community priorities that are identified by our community partners, relate to social determinants of Inuit health, um, especially those as defined by Inuit Tepedit Kanatami, the national Inuit organization. And so I think that there are a lot of connections to broader considerations in Arctic global health. I spend a lot of time um, focusing on the research process, so how do we best work together regardless of the topic that we're focusing on? And so today what I wanted to do is to focus on some key considerations around community-engaged research um, that you might be able to, to, to take and tailor and apply in different community, cultural, geographic, or, or disciplinary contexts. Okay, next slide, Adam. And the goal of the presentation today is to share these key considerations, but they, these were not just ones I developed for this particular presentation today. These are considerations that I developed with Theo Ikumak, uh, a longtime research partner of mine in Igluluk in Nunavut. And we prepared the points um, that I will share today in in getting ready for our testimony to a special Senate committee on the Arctic, and we presented to this Senate committee two years ago. So this was in April 2009. We were invited together to share our experiences in Arctic research to that special Senate committee. And the committee had identified a number of topics that they were interested in to build on the Arctic Framework Discussion Guide. So it wasn't just us, there were uh, many people invited to, to be witnesses to this Senate committee, and we were asked to consider the significant and rapid changes to the Arctic and the impact on original inhabitants. That was kind of the overall goal for that special Senate committee. And they had identified six themes related to environmental conservation and Arctic science. And so based on our own experiences, Theo and I, we felt most comfortable speaking to the three topics that you see here. So the role of science and indigenous knowledge in conservation and decision-making processes, the consideration of Arctic communities' knowledge needs, so mental health, housing, food security, especially in research priority setting and funding, and the access to post-secondary education and research opportunities for Arctic residents. So those were the three topics that we felt most comfortable speaking to. Those are the ones we emphasized in our presentation. And although this is now, you know, two years ago and, and, and time has passed since then, we continued to reflect on that experience and we decided to write up and share the speaking notes that we had prepared for the Senate committee because we didn't get nearly enough time to share all the points we hoped to make. So, so the points I'm highlighting today are just a, an excerpt, a few, of what we had in our full notes and we wrote up that piece as an Info North article, so like a newsletter article that's part of the Arctic Journal. So if you are interested in, in seeing the full, the full um, notes, they're in that Arctic Journal 2020, volume 73, and that was reflecting on 17 years of working together, so our time working together, Theo and I. So that's, that's what I'm hoping to share with you today. And Okay, yeah, you can go to the next slide before I get ahead of myself. Thank you. So I mentioned Theo Ikumak, so I want to give you some context on Theo before I get into this, because this really is a joint effort in identifying the key considerations today. 
So Theo Ikumak was born in an igloo in Igloolik in January 1955, and he grew up on the land between Igloolik and Sanirayak, or Hall Beach. And his experiences in residential school, losing both parents to tuberculosis while being away at school, and efforts to reclaim his language and land skills profoundly impacted his life and work. Theo and I met during my first visit to Igloolik in February 2003, and I was there doing preliminary meetings to explore community interest in a project to document Inuit knowledge and use of sea ice. And Theo is a skilled hunter and interpreter, and he was recommended to me for his experience on the sea ice, as well as in communicating with elders and hunters. And over the course of eight years, we worked together on, on the sea ice project in Igloolik. And it started with my doctoral research there in 2003. And then it continued to evolve. So then it was later a part of an international polar year project. And then further follow-up work as I started my first uh, faculty position at Carleton University, where I started in 2008. Theo's research role, though, quickly evolved from being an interpreter to being an advisor, for me, a facilitator of the research, a research coordinator, a guide when we were traveling on the sea ice, a community liaison, and, and a long-term mentor for me in, in Arctic research. We have kept in touch between various research projects, so we, we haven't had continuous research work together, but our work continues today as part of a new project where we're attempting to understand Inuit community uses and needs for weather, water, ice, and climate information and services. So that's the current project we're working on together. Okay, next slide, please. So I mentioned these key considerations that Theo and I worked on identifying together as the key messages to share with the Special Senate Committee. And we, we wanted to emphasize these four main points here. So in, in thinking about Arctic research and in thinking about um, sustainability broadly and considerations around education and environmental change, we, we're emphasizing community context, language, working together, and decision making. And I, I highlighted earlier in that Info North piece, we have a number of points related to each of these. And here, I'm just going to talk about three points related to each of these. And I'm not only going to talk about the work that Theo and I have done, but I will also bring in examples from, from other projects. And those other projects primarily are ones in Joe Haven, Nunavut, which is on King William Island in the Katikmiut region. Um, and also communities around the Kikitani or Baffin region, which are Kingite, Igloolik, of course, Tangertung, and Pond Inlet. So I realized after I sent these slides to Adam, I, I should have included a map here, but if you're not familiar with these places, I really encourage you to look them up and, and see where they are in Nunavut. Okay, next slide, please. So we're going to start with community context. Okay, next slide. When we were first coming up with these points, the, the first thing Theo highlighted was community context. And, and I always emphasize that with my own students as well. And have developed a course recently, Geography 715, to really think about community engagement in research and a big part of that course is thinking about, you know, how do you learn about community context and why is it so important? So the, the main thing that Theo is emphasizing here and that I have learned over time, over a number of years, is the importance of recognizing that the effects of residential schools, forced settlements, taking people south for tuberculosis treatments, among others, these are all colonial legacies that have lasting impacts to today, 
on family relations, on language, on hunting capacity, on food security, on mental health, on educational achievement, and many other social determinants of health. So Theo shared a story with the Special Senate Committee of being taken to residential school as a young boy, um, and in, in that experience there, essentially being stripped of his language and culture. And when he finally got back to his family, living full time on the land again years later, um, it was like his family didn't even know him anymore, didn't, didn't recognize him. He had changed so much. And his brother worked really hard to get him back, he described, um, but also really to, to help him regain his language and his culture. And I've heard many stories like this shared in interviews with elders and other research mentors of just the tremendous impact and, and intergenerational impacts and, and traumas in many cases of these colonial policies and that it's really important to, to recognize those and try to be aware and sensitive of these, even if they might not be um, discussed openly or, or, or not initially maybe as you're working in research partnerships but just to understand the impact that that may have on cross-cultural relationships, on perspectives of researchers, on perspectives of education. There's many long-lasting implications there. And it's important to recognize and try and understand that context um, in the particular community setting where you may be working. Next slide. Uh, there is access to post-secondary education and research opportunities for community members. A lot is being done in those areas. But in Nunavut, educational equivalencies often don't prepare students adequately for college or university. So that can make the transition really difficult. And Theo has been a member of the District Education Authority in Igloolik, and so he was also highlighting this concern. So there's been more and more emphasis in many communities across Nunavut to, to have more cultural school um, or land-based learning opportunities. So there's been some really great programs established. Um, there is a cultural school associated with Nunavut Arctic College, and there's many programs run by local high schools and other local community organizations. But it's always a challenge to maintain the continuity of these programs, um, especially around continuity of funding. So that's, that's one area where, where more, more support and multi-year options for funding would be really, really helpful. This aspect of land-based learning and connecting land-based and school learning was really highlighted in a project we did in Joe Haven. So with uh, with elders kind of guiding all of the research process in Joe Haven from 2011 to 2018. Um, this was a project to learn about caribou and the connections between caribou and community well-being. And the main emphasis there was on land camps, wanting to do land camps to, to help document and share Inuit knowledge of caribou but not to only share that with researchers, to really get youth involved and ensure that the elders and, and other really experienced adults were sharing with the youth on the land in context with the caribou. Okay, next slide. Another key point we wanted to share with the Senate committee was the importance of research training and training to enhance community capacity to lead research and that that's increasingly being incorporated into research design and funding but but still there's a lot more that needs to be done um, and to ensure that this is done in accordance with community identified priorities um, so through understanding those priorities from community perspectives and then working together in ways to support them. Here I wanted to highlight an example that was recently published in Arctic Science. Um, this is one of my PhD students that I'm co-supervising, Catherine Wilson. She has worked extensively with Sikumut, 
um, uh, a management committee in Pond Inlet for Smart Ice, which is a community-based monitoring initiative in Pond Inlet, among other communities. She's worked with them over a number of years to really rethink the entire approach to research and to really rethink what does Inuit self-determination in research mean and what does it look like in practice from a community perspective. And so she developed the Sikumut model with the Sikumut Management Committee to emphasize this kind of different approach so that everything is related to Inuit supporting Inuit self-determination self in research. But that all relates to embracing Inuit decision making, prioritizing community-based research needs, developing Inuit-specific values for research, and at the heart of that is strengthening Inuit youth capacity. So that her role as the non-Indigenous partner was more one of mentorship and support um, for the youth, and that the youth were, were learning various research approaches, not only from her, but from Sikumu, to, to undertake the research themselves so that they are leading all aspects of the work and that the results of that work stay in the community all the time. And Catherine is, is an ongoing support and is learning from that, but they are leading all aspects of the work. So that's, you know, that's really a very, very brief overview here. But if you're interested in that, the, the reference is there and I'm also happy to share the paper. Okay, next slide. So the next key consideration relates to language. Next. So I've heard from Theo, but also from others, Simon Okpakos that we worked with in Joe Haven um, and others in other communities and the elders would mention all the time that um, language shapes the way that we think and understand the world. And in the context of working with Inuit, it's really important to respect and emphasize local Inuktut dialect. And that was something we learned very early in the process of the sea ice research that I was involved in, um, and something that became really important in all three communities, Igloolik, Pangertun, and Kingite. And the examples you see here are from Kingite, so Cape Dorset, formerly Cape Dorset, where to understand Inuit knowledge of sea ice, we really needed to understand freezing conditions, melting conditions, uses and dynamics of sea ice from the language. And that to understand the concepts involved, the dangers, the uses, the changes, we needed to understand the, the terminology. And so we spent a lot of time documenting this terminology, and it was a way to understand the whole seasonal cycle of sea ice. As you see here, we're trying to arrange the terms according to seasonal cycles, but also it became one of the main priorities for, for each community to be able to share this terminology with younger generations and future generations, because um, not all of it is used commonly anymore in daily conversation and that it can really help support safety um, while traveling on the sea ice. And I guess the thing to highlight here, the, the local dialect is really important. So for Kingite, Igloolik, and Pangertung, it was each a full process like this in their own dialect because there are some very specific terms. There are certainly shared terms, but there are also very unique ice conditions in each place. So that was important to recognize and work with. Next slide. The next one I wanted to highlight here is recognizing the limits to translation between Inuktitut and English. So uh, in, in the three communities that we worked, actually all four, the three for sea ice and the one for caribou in Joe Haven, the caribou research, we we're working with interpreters all the time, that we were mostly working with, with elders who were speaking Inuktitut and we were trying to understand through interpreters in English. And it's really important to emphasize that there, there's a lot of limitations with that, um, both ways, translation both ways. 
And so the main point I want to highlight here is to just really recognize um, the difference between verbatim or literal kind of interpretation and the conceptual interpretation, understanding the underlying meaning of what is trying to be said and not just a word for word translation. So really just being careful to not take translation at face value. It's important to understand the underlying concepts and that helps to improve mutual understanding and to avoid misrepresentation. So the examples you see here are related to caribou terminology. This was from a paper in Arctic. And um, I won't be able to get into all the detail here because of time, but just to highlight that the more we heard the translations from Inuktitut to English um, terminology for caribou, the more we realized that it might not be the same way that, that say, biologists would understand uh, ways of talking about caribou. Um, and so the more we asked into it, we learned about these kind of nuances. Excuse me, Gita. There's five minutes left. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I guess I'll have to come back to that in the question period if anyone's interested. So next slide. Um, the importance of land-based learning is reflected in the experience of forgotten words or aspects of language coming back to you. So this is Theo speaking, but I've also heard uh, Simon say things like this. That, and I've seen elders and hear them talk about this. That when you're on the land the terminology comes back to you or the memories come back to you. It's in the act of travel or hunting or building an igloo that um, the memories and the words and the depth of knowledge comes back. And so this, this quote here of the land speaks to you, just remembering that importance of the, the connection to the land, learning in place and being in those places to talk about topics can be so important rather than just indoors, say, in an interview inside. Okay, next slide. So I'll have to pick it up here. This is always my challenge. There's so much I'd like to share. Um, so the next one, working together. Next slide. So I'll have to summarize these for time. Um, the first one is to support Inuit self-determination in research. And this includes diverse approaches to partnership, mentorship, and leadership. And so really, I encourage you to take a look at the National Inuit Strategy on Research. Um, there's, there's priorities identified there by ITK that are really important to consider. And think of what kinds of, what kinds of actions can you contribute to, whether it's an individual, a group, or broader initiative, there's always ways to connect and to support Inuit self-determination in research. What you see here is one example from Catherine's work that I mentioned earlier with Sikumut and Smart Ice, and what can result from Inuit self-determination in research, where um, these are important, this is important guidance from Sikumut to community members about being prepared to travel on the sea ice. Next slide. This is another one that's really important to me um, and that I emphasize with all of our research partners. Um, collective effort means collective credit. So really, I encourage you to think about how to best represent that collective credit. We've tried to to really incorporate that in co-authorship. Um, so so um, important roles and mentors like Theo has played or Simon and Johaven or others become authors on reports or papers or presentations that we do. Um, and it's really important to think about that as you continue your work in Arctic research. There's a lot of concerns from communities about researchers building their careers on Inuit and community members not being recognized or receiving benefits. So what are the ways that um, research can translate into benefit for community partners? Next one. The third one here is recognizing and respecting 
cultural beliefs. So some topics are considered inappropriate to discuss based on the belief that it will cause that kind of event or animal encounter or danger to happen. Um, I have a whole example to share there, but if anyone's interested, just ask me that in the, in the questions. Um, researchers really need to work with knowledgeable community members who can help guide and facilitate the research according to local priorities and appropriate methods. And that is also related to identifying relevant people to being relevant people to be involved based on the questions that are going to be asked and the topics of interest. Okay, next one. So this is the last set of considerations here around decision making. Next slide. So it's really important to respect and value Inuit and scientific knowledge each in its own right. Um, so there's a lot of value of, from Inuit knowledge and Inuit ways of knowing. There's, there's certainly value and um, importance in understanding scientific perspectives and, and approaching uh, topics through the scientific method. Um, they, these need to be recognized independently and then understood where those where those intersections are, where there's a complementarity, or where there's differences, why why are there differences, and what can we learn from each? So again, I could highlight an example there, but I, I won't go into it just now. We can talk about it in questions. Um, but this this work is related to our caribou work uh, in Joe Haven, and then a recent master's thesis uh, of one of my students, Emily Packett. Next Eden, about one minute left. Thank you. Thank you. It's important to recognize and respect different knowledge systems and values in evaluating evidence, credibility, and leadership. So I just want to highlight here, when, when we're emphasizing evidence-based decision-making, it's important to consider how do we effectively and equitably account for oral and experiential knowledge and to really think what is valued as evidence might vary according to Inuit and scientific knowledge. And so who is making the decision matters greatly and who's evaluating that evidence. There's a really great article, a really short piece by Janet McGrath on that in uh, a Meridian newsletter from, from the old um, Polar Commission on information-based and relationship-based systems. I really encourage you to, to check that one out if you're interested in this discussion. Next one. So this is the last one here, learning and respecting, sorry, learning about and respecting Inuit governance structures are very important in undertaking decision making and then honoring Inuit decision making practices. So that can relate to making decisions, what you see here in the images related to where to hold land camps, travel safety or making decisions about um, about uh, weather and ice services, that it's really important to listen to knowledge knowledgeable community members and that there's concerns from community perspectives when governments are only relying on science and not really bringing in that unique knowledge. Okay, next slide. So these are really Brief summary points here. If I had to boil it all down into in community engaged research, some key things to take away just to take time. In, it does take time in this process. And so it's important to remember that. Emphasize relationships, to watch and listen, to be flexible and creative and to practice compassion and find humor. So we, Theo and I talked a lot about you have to laugh and learn together. Um, and it has to be enjoyable for things to work out. Okay, so thank you so much for for your attention. I really look forward to your, your questions. And if you want to see the whole presentation, you can access it online, that Senate presentation. There's other details on my website. Thank you for your attention. Gita, thank you so much. Um, I was just uh, marveling at your pictures. They're just beautiful. So thank you for those. Did you take all of them yourself? 
Yeah, all the ones that are here, I have taken, yes. All right. That last one there is, uh, you know, that that's me in the comatic there. So I, I'm, I'm along for the ride and, you know, Theo's the driver or someone else is the driver. And so I really feel like that represents <laughs> this, this approach to research. Wonderful. Thank you so much for a really uh, informative presentation and really helpful in looking at uh, uh, other aspects of global health. Um, just a, a question to get us started. Um, you talked a lot about language, and uh, when we look at visually at the language, it looks very complicated, of course, because it's so different from our own. Um, what are some ways to support language preservation and learning if, if a project is not specifically focused on language? Right. Yes. Well, when when I went into the sea ice research, I you know I was interested in learning from Inuit knowledge about sea ice, but never really thought about, um, thought that it would become this kind of broader effort around documenting Inuit terminology on sea ice. And it just, it became so important as we listened to interviews over and over, you could hear certain words being used. Um, and it was really important to, for me to start learning some of those words. To, so to ask, you know, what does that mean? And try to get at those underlying meanings, the concepts that were being conveyed. So I think, I mean, it was the same thing in the Caribou project, that language wasn't the main emphasis, but it became a really important aspect because if you're working together, we have to make sure that we're understanding each other. And especially across languages, that's, that's really challenging through interpretation. So I, I do think it's important to, to take that time to try to understand. It's, it's certainly a challenge. And, and those really knowledgeable uh, facilitators and mentors like Theo and Simon and others um, play such an important role in that, in helping us understand the language. And it became a real emphasis for anyone sharing their knowledge in interviews or workshops that the language was important not only for the research, but that it was most important for the youth to, who would be traveling on the sea ice or who would be hunting caribou. And, and just to understand the conditions according to nuanced language for safety or for a successful hunt. And so it just... I would encourage anyone interested in these um, kinds of approaches to really think how you can bring language into that. It, it helps that shared understanding, but it also really can contribute to community goals for, um, for language learning and, and passing on that language. Thank you for that. Um, one of our previous uh, speakers was Harz Lars Hellander from uh, Norway, and uh, he's from the Sami Nation. And one of the things that he talked about was that um, there is a certain amount of skeptic skepticism with uh, researchers from the south um, coming up north to to uh, do their research. And I'm wondering if you encountered any of that in your experience, and if so, how you handled it. Mm. Yes, there's certainly there's certainly still skepticism and there's a lot of concerns about the way that research was done in the past. Um, there's some some communities have had really uh, really difficult history with researchers coming doing doing the research sometimes even in a short amount of time going away writing a book about it and, and taking the credit for things that they learned in the community and the community is not really hearing back. So we have heard many stories of that over time and, it, and in multiple communities. Um, at the same time, there's a great openness from any of the, the organizations we've worked with, there's a great openness to still working together. There's an emphasis on working together and um, wanting to work together in partnerships to support community priorities. So there's a lot of openness still, and we've been really fortunate to have 
very, very positive experiences in each of the communities that I've worked in. Um, what was the second part? How you've dealt with that? I've, I've definitely had hard questions, like like what I mentioned briefly in in the talk about you know hunters and trappers organizations, the board members specifically asking me like you're going to get a PhD out of this. What are we going to get? Like mm -hmm. it's and it's important to think about that, and it really made me reflect a lot on that, and and that from those kinds of questions. Um, always trying to consider what is the benefit to the community. And in the case of the sea ice projects, one of the main ones was that sea ice terminology, like having that compiled in a way that could be used in the schools came up over and over and over by people we were working with or these organizations like the Hunters and Trappers. Um, I think the biggest way of dealing with that is is one just taking time to get to know people up front not jumping into something really thinking and and taking time to learn about what are the community priorities and so how can research address that and not just going in with your own plan and sticking with it no matter what um, and the other one is reporting so that came up over and over too about how researchers would take take all the work away and the community wouldn't hear back and so that also stuck with me. And so we've really emphasized uh, different ways of reporting in communities, in written ways, in presentations, on the radio, you know, trying to think about diverse audiences um, and to make sure that copies of everything that's recorded are left in the community and not so, so that they're accessible and they're not just sitting on a, on a shelf in a university. Thank you for those really concrete examples of uh, what you can do in order to combat uh, skepticism. Because when you think about it as, at a conceptual level, it doesn't get down to what's, what are some concrete things that you actually did. So thank you for that. Another question that's also very concrete is around, uh, you said land camps. Um, can you elaborate more on how these camps were organized and what topics were discussed there? Mm. Yes. Well, we're actually in the final process of revising a paper where we hope to be able to share all the details on that. Um, but the land camps, oh, how are they organized? We had a, a planning committee in Joe Haven who, who really guided all of the planning. So it was mostly elders in that committee, but there were some really experienced hunters as well that were part of that. So we did a number of meetings up front. So each each camp had a planning meeting workshop with just the elders, the planning committee, with the youth that would be involved, and then with everyone together to make decisions about those learning goals, the teaching goals, and logistical aspects of where it was going to be and all the, all the planning around equipment and travel, et cetera. Um, the camps in Joe Haven uh, were in 2011 to 2013. The, the second two years were on Adelaide Peninsula, so we had to take boats from Joe Haven. It was a few hours by boat, so there's a lot more logistics there. The, the topics were mostly around caribou, so everything to do with caribou hunting, um, environmental observations and safety, uh, preparing the skins, preparing, you know, being able to, to preserve the meat, things like that. Um, but there was also many other aspects of learning in the camp that were happening all the time around preparing food, around learning about plants, around um, language, especially learning stories from the elders. So there were many aspects of learning there that were kind of organized and then that were just intangible happening all the time by by having having the camp and being together on the land. And then there was follow-up meetings that we always had after the camp was over to see, you know, what could be improved for next time. Or also a lot of discussion about how can we ensure that there's continuity of these camps over the years. The community has all the capacity to do that. They have all the knowledge. They, they led everything about the camp because as someone from Ottawa and now Hamilton, you know, I don't know where the best place 
to go hunting caribou is. So I don't know all the safety considerations. So they were guiding all of that. But there is a challenge with the funding that's needed to support everyone traveling on the land. Um, so they work on that ongoing with a, with a local committee that they have that runs a lot of cultural programs in Joe Haven. Speaking of funding, it sounds like your uh, projects are well funded. Um, and the next question says, what have been the best policies or programs from a funding point of view that have supported this deep level of community and cultural engagement? Can you speak about that? We I have been very fortunate with, with funding support. Um, I think one of the most important things was to me the shirk um the shirk initiative where they they developed some what was it called initiative it was called research development initiatives which actually allowed me to go to joe haven the first time and just have a planning meeting like the whole grant was just about getting there and having meetings to decide what the priorities are in the community for, for community members to really identify that there was no particular research goal other than understanding shared priorities. And then since then, um, there's SHRC has developed uh, a different kind of structure, but they're called development grants now. And they're they're so they're so essential. They're so important to support this kind of work to really do the community engagement needed up front to then apply for larger funds like insight grants or partnership grants. Um, so most of my funding over time has come from SHRC, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, um, and that policy change to these more development grants has been incredibly helpful. And that's meant that we work with community partners to develop the larger grants to secure the funding to support the community priorities. So, so the entire process, even securing the funding, is collaborative and I think that's also partly why we've been successful because we really take a lot of time to try to connect it with those community priorities and develop the methodology around um, what's relevant and appropriate in the community. Okay. Um, you talked about developing a course at McMaster and the questions are just flowing in here. So. Um, uh, that starts with geography, and could you mention its code? <laughs> that's very concrete. Yes, that's a great question. So actually, Adam, if you want to go to the next slide. Thank you. So the, you should be able to see the course code there. It's currently, it's called, it's still called GEOG, although our school name is now School of Earth, Environment, and Society. But the grad courses are still this GEOG code. So it's Geography 715. And that is actually a reading course code, but I've run it last year and this year as a course called Community Engaged Research. Um, I'm running it like a facilitated <clears throat> reading course. Um, and we have students from McMaster, but also students from other universities. So if anyone from other universities are also interested, that's certainly an option. Um, I won't get into these questions, but I did want to bring them up in case you want to read them while I'm talking that these are questions that students in this course have been raising over the past few weeks in our in our discussions. And, and there's many more. They've had amazing questions. And um, so these are just kind of for ongoing reflection for your own work if you're interested in thinking about you know different aspects of community engaged research. These are just some ones that we've been thinking about in this course and continue to think about. There's no there's no one answer, there's no one way to do it. Um, it's a lot of self-reflection and self-learning in this process and then a lot of, you know, working together on all those points that I was highlighting to, to keep to keep improving that research relationship. So let's take a look at that sixth one. We know that um, when there's conversations about evidence-based research, there's an assumption that it's based on science. And, uh, you know, there's a peer review, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's so many stages and, and so on. When you're in conversations with people uh, in your, among your contemporaries who 
you say, well, that research isn't evidence-based, and there's an assumption underlying that statement that it must be science-based. And you've got such a strong background in how you do research with the Inuit in the North. How do you respond to those types of statements? Mm, that it's that it's not evidence-based? Yes, if someone challenges you on, on the constructs of your research. Mm. Um, I would say that that it depends on how you think about evidence and everything that we're doing, although it might be different from instrumental monitoring or, you know, looking at statistical analysis or experiments, you know, it's, it's still all based on evidence. And that evidence is the long-term lived experience of community members that we partner with. Um, and that, I mean, there's certainly lots of value in the scientific method and there's lots of value in, in evidence in terms of numbers and documented written information. But I think what people, uh, I don't, I don't know, but I think often what, what we think of in a, in a southern context or in a government context around evidence is something that's documented and written and tested. Um, and, and there's so many other kinds of evidence. And that's what I, I highlighted only briefly. Like we really need to think about how do you include that oral, oral histories? You know, they are evidence. They are long-term oral histories passed on through generations that are really important historical and cultural perspectives that can't be under, can't be learned any other way. Um, and that, that there, those are valued in, in Inuit societies, those are valued. What, what scientists might call evidence is not so valued in the Inuit context because that doesn't ensure your safety on the sea ice. Um, it's, it's really a perspective thing. So we have to understand that in different cultures, leadership and credibility and evidence are going to be different. Um, so if we're looking at it from a more Western perspective, evidence might have one, there might be one approach to looking at evidence, but from a community perspective, it's a whole different, like from an Inuit perspective, from what I understand from, from our research partners, it's a whole different perspective. And that's why there's, there's not always, sometimes there's disagreement because the evidence from a community perspective can be very different from a scientific one. And then there needs to be careful discussion. It doesn't mean that one is automatically better than the other. Thank you so much. That, that <laughs> That's a hard question to answer, but um, it's, it's a really good one. one and I'll give you an easy one now. <laughs> okay. This one's really easy. Uh, how do you see the future of community-based research 10 or 20 years down the line or some other recent developments? Are there, are there things you'd say 10 to 20 years down the line, here's what I see happening? And we'll close with a question. <laughs> um, well, I see Inuit leadership in, in research. I mean, that's already happening. There's, there are a number of um, northern and Inuit-led research centers in Nunavut. I'm mostly speaking about Nunavut because that's where I have most experience. Um, so I think we'll see more and more of that and that I think partnerships will still be important, but it will be the Inuit um, project leads that will be reaching out to others to, to bring in partners as needed or if needed. Um, so I think there'll be more and more of that. And I, I hope anyway, I think it's already going in that direction. And that ITK strategy is really important part of that, as well as community community developed strategies that are already already happening. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. But I, I think I would see a lot more of that and and that um, the role of, of academics will be even more in that kind of support role um, uh, as as needed, basically. And otherwise we may be changing our, our focus <laughs> quite a bit. Well, we'll just have to have a few more webinars like this one. Thank you so much uh, for your exciting presentation. And clearly, you get much joy from your work. You have a, uh, a smile that doesn't stop. <laughs> Thank you for, for a very joyful presentation, your observations on community-engaged research for, for northern sustainability.
Um, I want to thank everyone for your questions as well. Really insightful questions today that uh, uh, really rounded out uh, Gita's presentation. So let's quickly wrap up. Um, thank you again, and uh, we hope the information that's been provided and discussion was relevant and useful in expanding your perspective on global health in the Arctic. And we look forward to hosting the next eighth webinar entitled Roots of Northern Indigenous Peoples' Health, Connecting Autonomy, Self-Governance, and Power in the Circumpolar North. That will be held uh, next Monday, March the 29th, from 10 to 11. Again, it's Eastern Daylight Time for those of you that are outside of our, our time frame. And it features Dr. Nancy Doubleday, the Director of Water Without Borders, and the inaugural Hope Chair in Peace and Health, and Professor in the Department of Philosophy at McMaster University. Thanks again, Gita. Everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. We look forward to your participation in our next exciting webinar. Thank you. Merci. You too. Thanks very much.